Alrighty, we're live. Welcome, welcome everyone to the ninth event of the Solana Wormhole Hackathon. Today we have an incredible panel for y'all. Today we have Fernando, who is the founder and CEO of Balancer. We have Emilio, who is a lead blockchain developer for Ave. We have Michael, who is the founder of Curve, and then we have Anatoly, who is the founder and CEO of Solana. And today we're going to take a deep dive into different liquidity pools and how they work throughout various protocols. And so each guest is going to take some time kind of explaining how their individual protocol works. And then we'll answer um, uh, guest questions and chats from in the panel as well. So I think totally uh, I'll let you take it from there and we can just do a quick introduction of everyone and I'm going to jump off stage. Have fun. Awesome. Um, I think we probably have a lot of folks joining again, but uh, Michael, you, since you've introduced yourself before, uh, you can do like a, a quick one. But I'd love to hear like everyone else's role at at, uh, at their project and how they view the space. If, if, go for it, Michael, too. So um, we'll start with you. All right. All right. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm Michael, the founder of Curve. And Curve is, as, as you probably already know from previous panels, is automatic market maker for stable coins. And um, yeah, I think I wouldn't, wouldn't take longer. Uh, Emilia. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi guys, I am Emilio. I am one of the core devs of Ave. We are uh, me and another six or seven guys are essentially there responsible for the core development of the smart contracts and the front end of Ave. Uh, really excited to be here, and especially because integration between AMM and lending protocols is something that I think will be very, very interesting in the upcoming months. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for Fernando. Fernando. Hey, hey guys, this is Fernando. I'm co-founder and CEO of Balancer. So Balancer is a protocol for programmable liquidity. So it allows you to create liquidity pools that are not restricted to two tokens and 50-50 weights like Uniswap. You can add two or more tokens now up to eight, and you can choose different weights. So you can have like a pool with 10% WAF, 10% WBTC, and 80% DAI if you're conservative. And what Balancer does is it automatically lets um, Arbors rebalance your pool for you. So what you have is essentially an index fund where you get paid for providing liquidity as opposed to paying a fee, uh, which happens in the conventional financial world like you go to Fidelity, you have to pay like a, a monthly fee to give them your money uh, to let them like uh, rebalance it for you. So yeah, that, that's Balancer in a nutshell. Um, I think like if, if I, I hope I'm not mistaken, but I think like even Ave underneath the hood with its automatic interest rate adjustment has a similar kind of like mental model to an automatic market maker. Um, uh, well, Mm, partially in the sense that like uh, the the market our uh, market is algorithmic so uh, it uh, adjusts in real time to demand on offer in the sense that like the the more liquidity there is available the cheapest it is to borrow it and on the opposite side like uh, the the less liquidity available the more expensive it is to borrow which of course like um, achieves Two goals at the same time. The first goal is to attract more depositors when the interest rates are high, and at the same time, uh, maybe like incentivize borrowers to close their position to provide the liquidity. Uh, our protocol specifically optimizes around a certain threshold of utilization. Uh, what we, um, what Ave tries to achieve is always to have some kind of. Uh, fractional reserve are always available for uh, for depositors to be able to withdraw. Uh, even it was quite interesting during these months uh, observing like how the protocol uh, behaved, especially like with the yield farming. It was interesting when compound compound started with the initially started with the yield farming that there was a lot of demand of, to borrow stable coins on Ave because people was using Aave as a bridge to uh, like for assets that were not supported on compound to move the liquidity uh, to to borrow stable coins to to yield farm on compound essentially 
it was also essentially it was also very very interesting to ob observe how the product was behaving during like the yield farming craze with a lot of assets not only stable coins being borrowed to to actually use them to deposit in the different uh, farms and we collected a lot of data and i think in the upcoming months we'll come with interesting uh, ideas regarding uh, the adjustment of interest rate models there are there is a lot of research on the on the field as well um this was like uh so in march when we were launching mainnet i noticed that like these automatic financial products started to gain a little bit of traction. I think it was still pretty small TVL. And I kind of looked into it a little more and I was kind of blown away by this idea that it's algorithmic and it's passive and there's no expiration, that it's continuous. Um, and kind of like turn traditional finance on its head because when you deal with like interest rates and options and all this other stuff, it's like, it, it's very much not not like something humans can understand, right? You have to buy a bond, it expires at a certain date, right? It generates yield up to that, and then the price of the actual thing fluctuates and totally different from the yield itself. So I honestly think that these products are kind of like revolutionary. Like even, even though the stuff I think has been theorized since the 70s, I think like partially the the slowness of Ethereum made this thing possible, right? It was a forcing function. Right. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, what, what do you guys, do you guys think that uh, there's a chance that these kinds of automatic systems will really like start taking a, a bite out of, you know, <laughs> bonds and options and all this other junk that we see in like an E-Trade? Like, are we gonna see E-Trade offering an AMM? I, th I think uh, they will replace most of uh, <laughs> most of the, but well, I'm a little bit of an AMM maximalist, so. Uh. <laughs> I'm biased too. I'm with you, Michael. Yeah. I think I think yeah, I think the the key to to get there uh, totally is to figure out scalability and yeah, mass adoption. I think that's like there's no way we can do that with. Uh, with the current 15 transactions per second and current gas prices that are actually quite um, like, we're really hurting the small LPs and the small kind of uh, players. So if you if you do a trade uh, of tens of thousands of dollars, it doesn't hurt you much to pay $20 per transaction. If you're trading or uh, moving $100 worth of crypto, then it's really bad to pay $20. So. Yeah, it's really very small guys, right? Today. Yeah, ban bankers would love it, by the way. Or like you know, minimum uh, minimum viable transaction is a million dollars. Everyone except banks is barred from using uh, using this stuff because it's too expensive. That's what they want. Exactly, and I well, think this is where you guys can can uh, play an important role, like other L ones as well. As well, there are uh, promising small fees with uh, lot lots of security. So yeah, I think I think it's a, a very important uh, thing that you guys are doing. Um, I I mean, like we can toot our own horn, but I think the space is really transforming from proof of work networks where block space is a scarce commodity to proof of stake networks where block space is plentiful and you're not going to have this kind of like supply constraint problems anymore. Even even not even you know I think our solution is the best lowest latency. It's going to have the best performance. But I think at the end of the day, all proof of stake networks kind of solve this problem. Um, so to but me, don't like, you think, I, sorry to interrupt. I, I was just curious. Uh, don't you think that um, kind of data size or blockchain size matters a lot for for decentralization? So. Of, it, it's not much the problem of like proof of work being uh, costly to like, you have to spend a lot of energy to, to, to mine blocks. It's more like how decentralized you can be with uh, uh, yeah, availability of, of the state of the blockchain and how fast it grows. Yeah, so separating those two problems, um, there is the ledger size and the state itself. Um, and in proof of stake networks, you know, Vitalik's famous post on weak subjectivity uh, basically kind of put the nail in the head uh, in, for that kind of 
it, it like forced the the proof of stake development to go into a certain direction where you assume that the network is live for some period of time. You know, E2 is targeting 90 days, but those time scales can be much shorter. Um, that the only history that you actually that, that the network cares about from a security perspective is the last 90 days or some amount of time. And that's the slashing period. The network cannot use information prior to that period. So it's kind of meaningless. And from that perspective, um, you can store that data, you know, in some really cheap, you know, uh, redundant storage. Uh, for example, we're using Arweave. They've solved the data per persistent data storage problem. <laughs> like, why do we need to solve it, right? We just dump our data set there. And then, uh, like, this isn't running yet, but um, the only thing that you need is how do I verify that this data is accurate? Uh, and RSA accumulators are a, a really good solution to that. But there's other techniques that can kind of accumulate state into small proofs. Like Merkle proof is like the, the traditional one. So. It's a different network, right? Different security parameters. And the main difference there is that something like Ethereum, where you have proof of work, you have guarantees from the electricity that you can deduce was spent to solve this puzzle, that there's a certain amount of economic weight to secure this network. And that is strong objectivity that you just don't have in proof of stake networks. So this is where I think like why there is no Ethereum killer because Ethereum is a proof of work element layer, and that's going to be that layer forever. <laughs> and uh, I think there's execution engines like Solana that are super good at a particular use case and basically pick a Pareto efficient, you know, trade off between speed, cost, data size, and, and things like that. The way we've been philosophy, you know, my philosophy is that like we're building for price discovery, which means that we need to guarantee that all the state was replicated around the world as fast as possible. So that that's kind of like what a, an exchange would want. Um, but there's trade-offs there. Maybe somebody that's building a DAG will have a, they have a different point in this Pareto curve. Um, but I think this is a different world for proof of work and we'll kind of see the, the universe of networks and use cases kind of move, right? I think Ethereum will always be this settlement layer and I think automatic market makers in this kind of slow, secure uh, network, I think, will also function really well, right? I, I can't imagine like a better platform to launch a project right now than Uniswap, right? Like you, you have a bunch of tokens that you want to distribute to a wide range of people. You put them in Uniswap with some like stable coin and all of a sudden you have a market and you don't really care as a team about the nuance of permanent loss and all this other stuff, right? You just want to just, you just want distribution. So like that, that's kind of like my, my theory is that like Ethereum killed the Binance IEO, <laughs> like totally, <laughs> like, uh, which is awesome, which, which is, I think is like, I couldn't, couldn't have been a better outcome. Um, so, so that, that's kind of like, I think our, our job, I hope Solana's is to you know, take a chunk out of Binance's like daily volume, like actually provide a, you know, censorship resistant open platform for people to have these like sophisticated spot markets and dynamic market makers. And for anybody like, you know, Ave to plug into this, but also like, I'm, I don't want to, this isn't about pitching Solana. So like, I kind of want to give the conversation back to you guys. What I was blown away by these algorithmic solutions is that they're passive and like Fernando, like you said, like, uh, ETFs charge people for this privilege, right. To give up money so that they can balance the portfolio. And here, this is done for you. Um, so this was to me, like, kind of like what, what turns the traditional finance on its head is that this little bit of code basically gets rid of like, you know, thousands of teams at all these banks trying to repackage this into a product where they can charge fees. Um, and the nicest thing, uh, totally, uh, just to agree on you there, is that it, it it just wasn't possible in the conventional world. Like, you need a, a custodian, uh, like a place to, to do the custody, you need a place for exchange, and you need all the regulators and, and all the licenses. It's like a million different pieces put together. And all of that has to be paid, right? The system has to be paid. And that's why you can't get around uh, fees for index, for conventional index funds. 
like uh, Robinhood, I think they, they don't charge any, but they have like hidden fees. So it's somehow you have to pay for that, right? And, and the beauty of uh, smart contracts is, is that like it's all in one place without any intermediaries and it's trustless. It's 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 beautiful, and I think that the most disruptive disrupt, uh, disruptive things that appear when you have like revolutionary technologies are things that were not possible before. So we're not, as I say, we're not just repackaging existing things into the blockchain. It's just things that could not exist uh, that I think people will slowly realize how much superior they are. And in order for that to happen, we need just like more better UX better uh, scalability, lower cost for, for transactions and, and all those things we know we need to work on as a, as a space like together. Yeah, also I think that like 24 seven availability and transparency are also two, two huge advantages that like blockchain based uh, economic systems like uh, Aave as a lending protocol or Balancer or Curve or Uniswap they have compared to uh, centralized finance because mm, like uh, a, a simple example I need I need my money at uh, uh, 11 p.m. <laughs> in, the, in the evening the bank will not be available to give you your money but if you are actually using a decentralized protocol then you can see at any point in time and complete, in a completely transparent way what is happening where your money is how is being used, and depending on the kind of protocol, more or less you have 100% availability of your liquidity at any point in time. And these are huge advantages that, like the financial, the traditional financial financial system, cannot compete. Yeah, by the way, they just kind of thought about uh, um, you know, like having different small users versus uh, versus a slow and not very scalable Ethereum, but very secure Ethereum blockchain is that it's it's probably possible to, to have these um, liquidity pool tokens of what is on Ethereum uh, bridged to Solana so that people can buy small pieces of those and uh, um, you know if even if uh, the pool which earns uh, which, which earns money stays on Ethereum even when it's expensive you can buy a penny of that on Solana and that kind of pool on Solana, pool of LP token on Solana can be arbitraged with uh, uh, with the one on Ethereum. And that, like, um, even even if market making is not on Solana, you, know, you could uh, could kind of use it to um, to scale to to like smaller users. Um, Very good that, idea. Yeah, that, that that to me, I think, is, is uh, pretty exciting, too. Um, we uh, we uh, helped on the contract side with the Serum folks, and they built out a, a very, very simple market maker, AMM. Um, and what was surprising to me, how quickly like passive income, like users want passive income. They want like continuous, simple passive income. How quickly they just kind of like funneled money into this thing. Um, I, I think this is one of these products that I think could break out into the real world if if we can teach you know regular humans how to deal with private keys <laughs> um you... I, I was just gonna say that uh what emilio said and, and it circles back to what you're saying totally uh emilio touched on the transparency and uh how how like a, available like 24 7 uh your money is and you can track it and that bring it has like a flip side of the point which is privacy and, and somehow security. So if you if people can easily know like who owns a hundred I don't know a hundred thousand dollars and you spend it uh, and people know okay it's it's you who owns that uh, uh, you who own that it it can be very bad. So it kind of circles back to what you said like holding a private key to something that is completely transparent. If that private key can be matched or connected to you, then you have problem, especially in, in countries where criminality is uh, is a problem. So yeah, I think another another important thing that we need to solve is um, privacy, and that comes many times uh, together with uh, with scalability because it's just more computationally intensive. Anyways, just wanted to point that out. Um, yeah, 
That, that's, that actually would be a little bit challenging by the regulators because they seem to be a little bit irritated by, uh, by all the privacy technologies and uh, they, um, they somehow think it's like, you know, terrorists will use that. Well, uh, terrorists right now use a very private coin called US dollar. Um, but yeah. And a, a private, yeah, private coin is the, the, the bank, uh, the bank note itself, right? No one knows who holds it. It's completely, yeah, kind of uh, in stealth mode. Yeah, uh, that that is like I think. I I personally think that regulators are mostly on our side because the systems we're building are fraud proof. They're transparent. Mm. There's an, at, at the end of the day, I think like most of the teams in the space are trying to build something where nobody can get screwed, and I, I think those systems are what regulators want, anyways. But they actually want some guarantees about. Um, so I am hopeful and optimistic <laughs> about where the space is going um i i guess uh do you guys what what, what is your take I, I guess from your point of view on how regulation is going to affect the space mm, you know i have this perspective that at some point like there will be some kind of um hard regulation coming in the hard in the sense that will be um some maybe specific enforcements to team working on blockchain or requirements to meet for people i mean on the on the on the on the contracts itself on the protocols on the underlying protocols you can't really as a as an as an entity uh, like a regular a regulation entity or, or whatever you can really do much right i mean the protocol is on a, on a network that is uh, censorship uh, resistant and like there isn't much to do like what can you do probably is more like on uh, on uh, entities that are well known that actually build in the space maybe like require em enforce kind of some specific requirements or uh, i don't know like re require to meet some specific guidelines to provide a certain kind of services which in my opinion I on depending on the uh, on the specific um, like uh, flavor of, of the of these uh, like requirements or guidelines or enforcements, I might agree with. I mean, personally, I like to build like uh, protocols that and uh, services that people can use, everybody can use. But I would not like to uh, like facilitate money laundering or like. Um, but people taking advantage uh, of this decentralized protocol to to um, push their business forward. So I'm all for regulation as long as it as it don't uh, doesn't like um, kind of slow down research and and development. So this is my personal point of view on the, on, on the topic. If regulation is to come, I hope that it will come like by respecting people that is building and that is trying to create something that is new and not actually trying to choke the space in something that is not, essentially. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess you are right that regulation probably wouldn't be able to affect protocols which are already working. So in this sense, right now is a good time to launch protocols. Uh, but yeah, if regulation comes hard on those who build, what we will witness is uh, many um, anonymous launches, I guess. Um, so, like, I mean, and I don't know if, like, probably, it, it, like, if it goes a little bit hard, it it will go out of their control. So they, they probably don't want to be too hard, and they well, it also depends on like what what do they want to achieve if regulation. Uh, uh, if regulation comes as something which legitimizes the project in view of people so that, you know, being reg if, if being regulated will be a marketing thing, maybe, maybe that will work. Um, but if regulations will be, oh, you know, enforcement comes, so <laughs> um, everyone be scared, then I think uh, it's 
just might go away from from their control and i don't know if it's good or not so uh, um yeah i guess i hope they they will uh, kind of uh, smartly adapt uh, to this space really i agree totally with you michael i think that they are like in essence i think regulators are good people well intended and they want to avoid people being defrauded exactly. right so they have like like as you said totally uh we're, we're building things that make it easier for uh for them for everyone to know that people cannot be uh screwed or or rug pulled uh at any moment like banks can can just do because there's no transparency and more and more people having bitcoin on their balance sheets uh companies and paypal uh kind of uh, embracing crypto i think this will this is going to be like happening more and more and at some point it will be just impossible for regulators to say like that let's crack down on bitcoin let's crack down on right. ethereum or DeFi, right um, like, they are already yeah. cannot crack down on bitcoin really uh, they can't yeah and they know they would miserably fail if they try to so they they're not uh, going to try to but, yeah. yeah and as time goes by like the the the, the DeFi's and the ethereum the solanas of the world they they will start to get like a Bitcoin level, uh, yeah. uh, non-stopness or yeah, it, ta it takes uh, you know ten times China would ban DeFi to to make it resilient. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I do you guys see like so? You know, I, I kind of saw this the space really quickly mature in the sense that you take a simple idea like a AMM and then people started really optimizing them towards different, different, totally different use cases. Um, I'm really like that kind of innovation is always inspiring to me. Um, what do you guys see like in the next kind of midterm of like coming out with uh, algorithmic kind of like continuous products? Like, I, I don't know what to call them, right? AMMs, I think is the umbrella term for all of this stuff, but I think any kind of automatic math that, that, that runs on chain, I think can kind of fall under that. Yeah, well, I guess their uh, AMM space is not is not actually uh, AMM kind of discovery space is not yet fully explored. I I feel there is a lot more to 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 get there right now. Well, even at least to be frankly speaking, either Balancer AMM or Uniswap AMM are not uh, yet um, kind of fully competitive with Binance, right? Uh, I mean, yes, they are great for like. Um, use case like launching a new token because you have no idea what the price will be so uh, let's say you know when when wifi launched on uh, pretty much launched on balancer right uh, it was uh, using this um, non non 50 50 uh, pool feature that that's great and it worked very well so um it launched and uh, probably better than what what it, what it would have been on centralized exchanges you don't need market makers uh, who you would pay and so on that's great so this niche i think is uh, very well served by current crypto amms but kind of uh, beyond that let's say you know um Bitcoin to USD market, right? For example, I think that uh, kind of for the same amount of liquidity, well, for the same amount of um, deposits on kind of in access of a of an exchange of a market maker, I think uh, centralized exchanges are at the moment more efficient. And yeah, I guess uh, Anatoly could <laughs> could very well say about that, right? Uh, like you know, we're getting closer. If you uh, like, if you look at serum spreads, they're getting closer to what you see on Binance. Um, right. So that, that, yeah, but but that's like order books. So order, order books as a concept are at the moment more efficient for uh, for cryptos, at least for established cryptos. For newly launched cryptos, it could be a different story. But for like something which is already which exists for at least a couple of weeks, um, <laughs> yep. then, yeah, the, that's already established crypto, right? <laughs> I, I agree with you, Mike. And I, I think that uh, something I'm, I'm per personally excited about and I think is missing a lot today in AMMs in, AMMs in general is more 
like adaptiveness, if that word even exists, like more intelligence to react to market conditions. Like Balancer is already, uh, uh, in my opinion, a, a great improvement uh, on, on Uniswap because it, it's just more flexible. And of course there's trade-offs, right? It's, uh, it's more complex and it, right. UX is a bit harder. So it's, it's trade-offs everywhere, but you can choose like a 2% fee. And, and, and Michael, what you said about uh, Wi-Fi, uh, they, they, they had like 2% in the in their pools or i think one percent oh. so they, they 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 made a lot of money like early lps in those pools made a lot of money from traders and that type of flexibility is great but actually what you want is something and today i like to use the analogy today we're we're using taxes only because uh you have a fixed fee like a taxi you pay like the same whatever kilometer you you, mm. you drive but we need what we need is is uber we need the liquidity pools to be uh automatically adapting their call, their prices, their fees to the market conditions. So right. if you think of Black Thursday or any time where like people yep. want to trade and they they're willing higher, to yeah. pay more, right? And, and that that's like good for both sides. It, it, you you increase the yeah. uh, the you decrease the slippage because you have more more liquidity because it pool's more profitable. Right. So you attract more LPs. And then the, the, the when when times are calmer, then the pool goes down with the fee uh, mm. to allow for traders uh, to to trade. So it, it that sort of intelligence is, is something that I think is missing and we're right. getting there, right? Um, yeah, I, th I think one good attempt is, uh, is Muniswap by one inch. Uh, well, in a way, fee is just a spread, right? And yeah, what, what they do when some trade happens, like if, if you draw graphically and uh, market depth of uh, what AMM does, it uh, basically looks like I don't know, like like this, right? With yeah. some with some spread open here. So what they do when the trade happens, you know, uh, one side moves like this, and then the other side slowly moves there. So and uh, so basically, if if the demand is high, then you you have this spread higher, which automatically means the same as fee being higher and uh, AMM working more, uh, like uh, AMM earning more, but. I don't know if it like always works well because like you um, may maybe some you thought the model could be a little bit different because like I I'm seeing that some pools there are earning a lot so it works but some other pools are not so for example for uh, you know a pool with CRV earns more on um, on Uniswap and Balancer than on Muniswap. I don't know why, but that's kind of, uh, there are probably different regimes and like it's a little bit understudied and it is just, uh, and like really all this world of AMMs is not yet um, kind of fully explored as we're just starting and uh, it kind of requires more research. I would say both like experimental and uh, mathematical on simulations and everything. So uh, one, one quick shill is that uh, running a central limit order book in the same state machine as the AMM allows you to kind of use that information atomically um, and without a uh -huh. need of Oracle. So you actually have effectively the book, which is computed by, you know, Alameda and Jump and the folks market making there with real skin in the game, right? When they create the spread, <laughs> they do it based on real prices and the risks that they're taking. So you can effectively like steal that information. And what's what I think is really cool about this is that this becomes actually beneficial for both sides because now there's more depth in the market from the passive uh, LPs. And that to me is like kind of like like, like oh. everybody's kind of working together, like in that. Speaking in that about space. using this information on Solana, are there flash loans on Solana? <laughs> uh, you could, I mean, like this would be up to the lending protocol, so we're not, we're not there yet. But to flash loans would be a way to, you'd have to, when you build this, you would have to design it to be uh, flash loan resistant. Okay. So you kind of need like a bit of, you know, an integrator, right? And Over even some, worse, over a flash meeting that is now becoming so. Uh... Like WBTC is thinking of implementing this flash minting feature. DAI is thinking of implementing this feature. I'm a little bit scared, to be honest, because yeah. it's like flash loans on steroids, <laughs> where you can essentially mint infinite money. But we will see how it pans out. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think maybe it's OK if governors can decide uh, how what is the upper limit which can be flash minted. Because if you 
when you can mint two to the power two fifty five coins, uh, you can break a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, we're go we're getting into numerical stability problems. <laughs> right, right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If I, can, if I can pick up uh, on the previous topic of like uh, aspects where I'm excited, uh, of what I'm excited about in the in the upcoming future. Like it's funny because I see uh, I listen to Fernando and uh, Michael and they they have like this mindset of how can we swap and we can be more efficient. While when I think about AMMs and what they are, I think, okay, we get shares in exchange, how we can reuse them <laughs> in a more efficient way, you know, because it's more like a, a, been building lending protocols where people can actually collateralize um, multiple kinds of assets. Like it, for me, it becomes very natural to think as AMM shares are assets that are very, very powerful collaterals. For example, yeah. uh, Fernando was talking about like the the fact that Banzer is essentially a automatic uh, rebalancing in index or fund or whatever we want to, uh, to call it. Um, in the upcoming, as Aave in the upcoming months, we will experiment a lot with um, with uh, AMM shares in specifically with uh, Balancer shares. Uh, shortly, we will come up uh, we will propose actually to the to go to the governance to to bootstrap a, a component of the Ave ecosystem that is called a safety module. Right now is uh, allowing to stake Ave. Uh, shortly we will create a proposal to the governance to actually um, stake also uh, balancer shares of with a ratio of Ave and ETH. We will also uh, will be incentivized and contribute to. Uh, kind of work as an insurance, a last minute insurance for the protocol in case in the case of recollateralization. Another aspect that I find very, very interesting is using those shares as a collateral in the markets themselves. So people can, I don't know, deposit in Curve or deposit in Balancer and use those shares as collateral. So they keep exposure to these automatic rebalancing indexes and at the same time they earn, earn the fees and at the same time can, they can have more capital efficiency by uh, borrowing against them. And I think in the upcoming months there will be, uh, especially on for uh, for us, for Aave, we, will, uh, we have version 2, Aave version 2 coming very, very soon. And there are, there is, we did, there are a lot of changes in our version two that like we will make kind of borrowing against this kind of assets very, very easily, very, very easy and also very, very fluid. You know, you, you will be able to uh, borrow against them and eventually exchange them under the hood or move between different positions like very seamlessly. So I'm really, really excited. Ah, and there is also another aspect like is the integration of uh, interest uh, yielding assets like a lending asset that is uh, an asset that has been uh, lent out on um, on uh, uh, lending protocols like Aave and use those in AMM. I mean, there, there are right now, for example, uh, some pools of Curve uh, they under under the hood deposit in Wyern that also deposits in Aave. Uh, there are some Wyern strategies that like they. Why a link that deposits in Ave under the hood and then uses the link to borrow in in Ave to to yield farm with the borrowing funds. So uh, there is already some some uh, integration from from on on these specific assets of using yield assets underneath and reusing them on IM, AMM or, and vice versa. Like from the AMM take the funds and deposit in a um, yield generating protocol like Aave. And I think in the upcoming months, there will be a lot of uh, more, there will be more research and more innovative integration on the, on the, on the field. Yeah. I, I think like one, uh, this like recursive like lending, right? Like you get AMM tokens back and then you put them into Aave and then you get like DAI to go buy it. I think this is like exactly what is done with a big pile of paper and inscrutable like uh, business deals in, in real finance and like having it actually on chain would allow us to like 
do some Monte Carlo simulations and see what the actual risks are. <laughs> I, I think ultimately this is actually building a more robust financial system because this is now like open and easy, like, you know, not easy to understand, but understandable by engineers. Yeah, auditable, auditable. right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, also we need to consider that uh, some, for example, uh, I consider a DAI ETH uh, balancer share, for example, to be a safer, from a protocol perspective, to be a safer collateral than only ETH, because there is, you know, this automatic rebalancing under the price of the share itself will always uh, um, re respect the ratio, the price between ETH and DAI, which means that which means that it's way harder to liquidate a, a, a loan that is created against a share like this than against ETH by itself. So from a protocol perspective, but also from a user perspective, use, use these kind of shares as a collateral to borrow is safer than using a plain ETH, for example. And oh. this is true for many assets. Also, this thing kind of creates a market for itself. Like yeah. if you have, I don't know, maybe maybe not with Uniswap, but with Balancer, yes. If you have an, uh, a pool, let's say ETH, uh, uh, ETH die, right? And let's say you are to liquidate this color, this uh, LP share, you could could do one-sided withdrawal for that, I guess. Just withdraw die instead of selling. Like, why not? Yep. yep. Um. Do you, uh, I think like my what what my what I'm scared of is uh, like co the compounding technical risk <laughs> of of a, of a single numerical like you know. Okay, like, that, that, that is true. I mean, when I say less risky is from a liquidity perspective, not from a technical risk perspective, because of course there is like more uh, compounding like risk from a smart contract perspective and from a whole system perspective. But from a liquidity perspective, it's safer, but then there is this whole aspect that is another story. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for Rust's check map, checked math that all the operations can can basically check for overflow by default. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but uh, we are getting Same it. With Viper. We are yeah. getting it yeah. in Solidity 0 0.8. We will get automatic, automated like, um, Oper arithmetic operation check. Oh, so software. safe math by default, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> it should have been there yeah, from the beginning. Bits is good enough for everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, we're, of course, also on Ethereum, we have 24 kilobytes uh, uh, smart contract size limit, but yeah. For, for now, it's enough for everyone, of course. Always will be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if you want bigger, bigger contracts uh, and more math, you can use Solana. Um, so I think in, in some ways, like Rust, uh, Rust big int is 128 bits. Um, and you always have to think about overflow because you're multiplying 64 bit values. So it's kind of like, I think in, in some ways you're less if you're like an engineer that is careful about the stuff, you're less likely to make mistakes because you always have to think about them. Um, <laughs> I, I find constraints, right, to be like where art can be created. <laughs> uh, if you if you have too many options, you you uh, you often don't know what to do. Um, do you, uh, is there like safe math? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Solana like built in, so oh, you don't need to. Do it's that just yourself. Rust. Right, so you like you use Rust the Rust um, um, libraries which have check uh, safe math operations. Just compiles in the check yeah. in, right? Yeah, yeah. Same with Viper, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You could like at the hardware level, you could basically check for overflow in every operation, but that's um, yeah, but that's not. I think that that may have unintended consequences um, that have like. For, for libraries that don't expect that, they actually expect values to overflow, you know, because they're mm. stupid C tricks all the way down <laughs> uh, at the end of the day. Um, I guess this this is from a, maybe a, a question for folks that are listening that are 
developing um what is the like what is your typical like kind of like verification audit process how, how do you guys go from idea to actually getting something on main um alt account on twitter uh, <laughs> and yolo it and see what happens <laughs> yeah I, I guess uh, for, for us it's more like um well, we need to get a very good test coverage first. That's the must. Like everything should be uh, should be in automated tests and the you know unit tests, integration tests, and also uh, we have like a re more recently we introduced stateful testing, which is um, well kind of a little bit like pretty much pretty much fuzzing where you discover like what uh what uh, what parameters can break your expectations um and yeah of course audits are good they are necessary uh, but they are not enough because uh like you know like with this uh, harvest hack for example there were i think two audits or something and still um it can happen so that's uh, i think it's really up to up to eventually up to the developer to get everything really really well tested and also we kind of we don't do much uh, of manual tests on test nets because i think those are probably good for composability like when you don't when you cannot really deploy something uh, uh, well um, deploy something in your test environment yourself um, yeah, but like when you when you have everything in automated tests I think you you can do more there and well maybe for developing UI um, test nets are good but like for safety I think it's it's more like uh, it, it's, it's better to have um, that like automated tests well developed and yeah, fuzzing is really a little bit underappreciated in uh, um, uh, in the crypto community. So should should be more of that, and hopefully, hopefully, formal verification gets there soon. So we are kind of starting to to look into that. Um, although it's a little bit early, but I think it's it's coming. So. Um, also not bulletproof like if you if when when you have formal verification it's more like more like super tests like more like uh, fuzzing which is uh, which can explore all the parameter space completely uh, but if you if you don't come up with a good spec you kind of don't don't get it so um but yeah and also we have monitoring like seeing or uh, looking for something which some bad things to happen like uh, for example we have the uh, invariant well i mean every mm has an invariant right uh, which and you can uh, define a specific invariant invariant per lp token which uh, which must not go down and we just set up monitors to see if it ever goes down and uh, like you could catch uh, like th these these things. Well, we did catch something like that in like pool, which we uh, deployed and started testing ourselves. So let's say you trade something and you you don't see anything suspicious. You exchange X coins into Y coins, all good. Yeah, but apparently these. Uh, tests can show oops their specific invariant went down so it, it's an indication of a loss happening and you start exploring and yeah mm, you know, something is bad and that's what we check in automated tests as well so so that we like share, catch it before deployment was that I an think overflow Michael pretty much answered yeah sorry yeah well, yeah I think you covered it <laughs> yeah yeah, other than other than the monitoring, which I'm not a hundred percent sure we do, but I think so. Mike McDonald, our CTO, is is amazing. So I'm I'm pretty sure he he thought of that and uh, probably is doing that already. But all the other stuff like fuzzing and 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 coverage and automated testing and those things, uh, yeah, we we do as well. And yeah, I agree with you, Mike, when everything you said, yeah. Yeah, on, on on our side is like also what Michael said is absolutely like relevant in terms of like we we also aim like for one hundred percent test coverage, 
sometimes is really, really tricky because some like achieving 100% test coverage sometimes is really tricky. Uh, but it's an effort that we we do to ensure that whatever we write is safe from a protocol perspective. Uh, also, for V2, we employed uh, formal verification. We we work together with Sertora. Formal verification, like Michael was saying, is really tricky because it's difficult from a, a technical perspective. Like for them, uh, it's essentially not possible to formally verify everything because that would lead to extremely, extremely complicated properties and invariants. Uh, mm, and the, as more importantly, the protocol needs to be designed for it, because if the protocol is not designed for, for uh, automatic verification of properties, then it's going to be very, very complicated for, the, for, for them to actually formally verify the protocol. So um, advice for the, for the public, when you read that a protocol is fully formally verified, usually is not true, because it means that some parts of the, of the protocol is are formally verified and also for the formal verification is very, very important to aim correctly with the properties because and the invariance because if you write the invariance incorrectly then of course the whole verification is uh, worthless essentially so but is i agree that in some aspects is absolutely fundamental for example to test the 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 properties of erc erc20 tokens we have seen in the past many issues with ERC20 tokens like uh, transfer of zero, transfer to yourself, uh, transfer to maybe specific addresses that might, could, could bring like uh, multiple types of uh, accounting errors within the contract. And with formal verification, the ERC20 is one of the typical example where formal verif verification is very, very easy to apply and is very, very efficient. Uh, we also have like, I think compared to, to AMMs, we have uh, some further complications that are related to the fact that the state of the protocol changes with time because of the accrual of the interest and, and everything. So usually you need to, we need to, for example, we wrote a, a specific uh, off-chain uh, engine that replicates essentially, it works as a predictor. And after, after an action that happens on the protocol, then the predictor predicts what should be the state of the protocol. And the tests are run against uh, those, uh, that predictor. And essentially, uh, we write a lot of different scenarios in a JSON file, for example. And then this JSON file contains all the different scenarios that we want to test with time travel and everything. And we ensure that the state of the protocol is consistent with the, with the scenario. And also having these two kind of uh, these two systems kind of guarantees us that when, whenever there is an incons inconsistency that one is giving a result and the other is giving another result, then there is a bug in uh, either in one or the other. So we have this kind of um, two side um, validation of the results that we, we expect. Uh, also, I agree also with Michael when he said that aud audits are important, but the audits only tell one side of the story really they don't tell you everything because like of course we cannot expect auditors to have 100 percent full understanding or i mean all would takes a lot of usually you see maybe our audits or of three four weeks for two auditors if the protocol is complex i can guarantee you that they are not going to understand fully the protocol in four weeks because it's really complicated to understand all the edge cases so Audits are very, very important, but they only tell one side of the story. What is important is also that the developer uh, team puts enough effort in uh, reviewing and validating the code that they wrote, because it, it, audits will not save you from, from potential hacks or abuses we have seen already multiple times. And it's not fault of the auditors, to be honest. I don't blame the auditors when this happens, because it's not their fault. And in it's general, just, so yeah. software have, have bugs. I mean, we cannot think that there are no bugs. It's almost impossible. I mean, unless it's something very, very simple. In general, complex software systems, they have bugs. I mean, we cannot. Yeah. Multipliers and hardware had bugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
you know, like Intel had like a, a flo floating point division bug, right? That bricked up, basically bricked one of the Pentium lines. Um, yeah, even so even worse the uh, last one, the the meltdown and the, the Spectre, uh, where you can actually read the state of the privileged memory. That was the well, worst one. That, well, uh, that is a complicated thing because it involves caching and uh, context switching and privilege sw switching privilege. That's basically impossible to get right. <laughs> <laughs> They, they should rename their their like SGX to something from trust zone to like possibly trusted zone. <laughs> um, May, maybe yeah. trust. Yeah, <laughs> quantum zone. <laughs> you may, may may or may not trust the state of the system. Um, there's some interesting some questions that might be fun to answer. Um, so, with with the issue of impermanent loss, how do you how do you think we'll continue to uh, incentivize liquidity providers to maintain reserve pools. Um, what, what's your view on this? Like, I think you guys have totally different projects and different, I think, solutions to the, to the space. I'm kind of curious to hear. I, maybe I, I'll just go first because I have to, uh, unfortunately, I have a hard stop now. But I, I think that, um, and I think Michael agrees with me, uh, we discussed this on other channels already. It, it's just inherent to providing liquidity that since you're selling something as it goes up, if it ends up being a lot higher, then you will, you sold it for less. So if you compare it with, uh, with the final state, of course, you lost money compared to holding uh, that. So it, it, it really, there's no magic in, uh, like there's no way to prevent or to uh, stop impermanent loss altogether. It's just, um, it's it's a consequence of uh, like market making, and sometimes you want to reduce exposure uh, on something that keep go keeps going up, and uh, it's it's just like uh, yeah, your your intention when you provide liquidity should be to rebalance, uh, and and there's different ways to kind of mitigate the loss that you have if you really see that as a loss. For example, increasing the fees when there's more volatility. Um, making sure that you have correlated assets, which is something that Curve does very well. Um, so there's, there's and, and I'm sure there's going to be other interesting solutions in the future that will uh, people will come up with. So it, it's a it's an ever kind of evolving problem. But I just think there's no like uh, silver bullet. It's just trade trade offs that people will come up with. Uh, and and whenever someone says we solved impermanent loss. I, I like immediately get very worried and, and don't really believe them. Uh, yeah, guys, it was really fun. Um, thanks for inviting us uh, on Tolly and Michael, Emilio, great talking to you. Talk to you yeah, soon, thank bye. You. Yeah, take yeah, care. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you so much, bye bye. Cool, I think, I think with that, we're we're just just about done. I think we're we're wrapping up right on time, which is a first for these panels. So, well done, everyone. Um, Emilio, it was great to have you join us. We 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 really love everything Ave is doing. Congratulations on all the it was the a recent news with the decentralization. Michael, you you've been a pleasure joining all of these panels as well. Yep. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. And Anatoly, amazing job as always hosting these. This was a really really great discussion, and I think we kind of took a deep dive into all different aspects of liquidity.